Hey everybody, Last Outrider here. It's been a while, but I now bring you The Underworld War Part 3, now that I've found my book again. <laughs> the Emperor's lapdogs were beginning to realize the value of the Forbidden Librarius once more. I believe we'll see soon enough. Karutal's wings gave another shiver. Closed tight to his back, they were a worthless cloak of thick-veined, folded, leathery membranes. He had not flown in months. Few caverns were spacious enough to allow such freedom. But why the surface, brother? What awaits you there? The dead. Karutau replied. I intend to live. I will escape Kalf, even if I am the only word bearer to do so, and I will remember who died here. I will make the Legion remember. They already remember. You cannot leave until the war is won. You are deluding yourself. Karutau lifted an arm where a beaten iron medallion star was bolted and hammered into the ceramite of his forearm. Where is the graven star? He turned his hand, showing a ritual engraving of a sinuous serpent. Where are the asps of the sacred sands? He reached to his chest plate, where a ruined parchment shone the faint signs of a red palm print. Where is the flayed hand? I will tell you, Thule. The graven star is dead. The asps of the sacred sands are dead. The flayed hand are corpses at the bottom of a pit, skulls leering up in silent laughter at their fate, lost to an ultra ultramarine's ambush. How many of us remain? We lead starving weaklings in a war with only one end. The 13th will destroy us, and our legion will remember none of it. Karutal turned his pauldron as he spoke, showing the mangled sigil of the twisted ruined chapter. How many chapters have died down here, Thule? It has been seven years. Where are your brothers? He gestured to the snarling demon face on the Terminator's shoulder guard. Where are the rest? of whole Beloth's men. The two word-bearers stood in the pregnant silence, saying no more. To Karutal, the dark caravan was a manifestation of every other cave. It embodied every night spent down here in the lightless, blood-smelling black. Thule finally spoke. You truly mean to abandon the Legion, Jerudai? They abandoned us, Karotal replied. Lorgar isn't coming. The Legion has left us here to die. I am going to the surface. You are damning yourself. To apostasy, the Terminator growled, a Calchesian command, and the blades lengthened from their housing on the back of his oversized gauntlets. And you know, I must kill you for even voicing this, admitted Thule. Karutal nodded. I know you must try. Bad secrets always tended to be buried in the deepest. After leaving Thole's cavern, 
blood-stained, and even more battered than when he had arrived, it took Karotul almost a month to reach the surface. The journey was not an easy one. The underworld war raged, as it had raged, for almost seven years, in brutal spits and spurts, filling the caves with the grind of overwhelming violence for several nights, then fading back to give a few hours of respite. Karutal had fought on Istvan V, when the skies burned black from the funeral pyres of three butchered legions, until he had been forced to burrow beneath the surface of Kalth, he had honestly believed Isvan to be the pinnacle of what was possible in war. The apostate walked west once he abandoned his brothers below. Always west, towards the setting arc of the poisoned sun. Its swollen blue malignancy stained the sky cancerous in imagery and in the realities of its radiation. He was sweating inside his armor, in the places where his armor had not yet become his skin, where his flesh had fused with the ceramite. He either did not need to sweat or simply had not encountered conditions vile enough to bring about a bodily reaction. Sometimes he coughed up blood, expelling it through the maw of a bestial teeth his helm's mouth grill had become. It was not the radiation. That was just his body adapting. The ghosts of Kalf fought as he went west. They paid him no heed, for they were mere memory and he was iron and blood and bone. The apostate word-bearer heard their shouts and cries, seeing the dead warriors as flashes and flickers at the edge of his vision. He listened as they waged a war both sides had already lost, reprising their roles from the day this world had died. When he did not walk, he flew. Before Kalf, his wings had been beautiful things, a swan's pinions, white feathered and clean. The underworld war leached their health, shedding feathers like autumn leaves, accelerating the change as the demon within exerted its influence over his genetic code. The swan's wings had become something bony and bladed, a spread of leathery flesh with thick veins and lightning bolt patterns across the silken membranes. Stronger now, without a doubt more useful. Stronger? But stranger, they smelled of animal musk, and they sweated blood. Stretching them felt no different from folding one's arms wide. Despite the weight of his armor, beating them three times was enough to lift him from the ground. He could not fly for long, though, for the effort sapped all strength from his muscles. But once high enough, he could glide for an hour or more. He did not sleep on his travels. He had evolved beyond the need for it, even beyond the slack limits of his regenesis among the legions of Stardé. He no longer needed to eat, though thirst was ever a plague. Dehydration thickened his tongue. Swallowing his own saliva was a blessed but false relief. Sometimes he would swallow his own blood. 
He journeyed across the unending plains, crunching the blackened husks of vegetation beneath his boots. An ocean of unharvested crops, dried and rotted from the dragon's breath heat of an irradiated sun. On the ninth day of his journey, he walked through a dirt storm. Solar radiation tortured Kalf, toyed with it, making a mockery of its weather patterns. The apostate saw the horizon darken with the coming maelstrom, a tidal wave of earth dust and tormented soil. He prepared for it as it rolled down from the western mountains, though those preparations consisted of nothing more than folding his wings tighter to his back. Instinct made him reach to check the conductive strip of mag-locking metal that bound his bolter to his thigh. But he reached for thin air. He had lost his last gun long ago. When the winds howled their highest, and the grit clattered against his ceramite armor in a ceaseless gravelly barrage, the apostate trudged on through the darkness, blinded by the dust of his violated world. He could all too easily imagine that the planet hated him, as if the world's soul sensed the last defiler upon its surface and wheezed its last dirty breaths to spite him. He knew war, and he knew how warriors died. How many slipped into death with a final curse on their lips. Kalf itself, evidently, was no different. He reached the first graveyard on the eleventh day. This was why he had come to the surface. This was why he was here. Someone had to remember. The graveyard owed nothing to the stately order of rural cemeteries and their rows of stone tablets and resembled even less the sand-blasted Minhir hinges of Colchesian burial grounds. Here was carnage, spread thick upon the churned earth. Tank holes rotted in the sickly light, darkened by rust, giving infected teeth leers from their corroded dozer blades. The bodies were mummified in their sundered armor, cracked open to desiccate in the wounded glow of Viridia. Karutal hiked through the slain, seeking the sigils carved and burned and sculpted into shoulder guards. On every red-armored corpse, the same gray-painted skull, its mouth, was an iron lock closed to silence all speech. The unspeaking. The unspeaking died here, annihilated beneath an ultramarine's counterattack. These bodies were not from his chapter. Then, the unspeaking were warrior sages to match any others, stilling their tongues with proud oaths of silence. Karutal respected them, but he had little to do with their works. Among the word bearers dead lay hundreds of ragged skeletons clad in shreds of cloth and dirty rags. The unspeaking's faithful followers, no doubt. After nearly seven years in the tainted sun, they were little more than husks, 
but he knew that if he had chanced upon this gravesite in the hours after the battle, opening their slack jaws would have revealed tongueless maws, a display of the unspeaking's ritual mutilation for its oath-sworn serfs. Karutal took two things from the unburied dead. The first was a bolter, graving with kill markings and patchy with corrosion, but proven functional after a test shot sent a shell pounding into the armor plating of a nearby rhino. He felt no guilt at breaking the silence of this massacre site. He could not inflict any greater indignity upon them than that which had already been endured, baked to the bone by a fouled sun. The second thing he stole was a talisman from around a warrior's neck, a simple necklace of cheap bronze with the warrior's name, squad designation, and chapter signal symbol scripted in Colchesian cuneiform. A rare token. The habit was much more common among the lesser soldiers of the Imperial Army, with their identification tags necessary for collating casualties. As if anyone would care about the management of mere human corpses in a war led by the legions. He tied the trinket around his wrist and walked west, leaving the first graveyard behind. And that's part three. Until next time. Bye. <laughs>